year around Halloween, we are treated to an outpouring of what could only be described as scare literature, telling us about how the holidays, satanic and evil, and should not be celebrated by Christians. These opinions are backed up by some rather unusual and very frightening fantasies masquerading as historical facts. The following videos are not intended to address whether or not Satan exists, nor to show that witches are nice granola eating vegetarians and tree hookers who would harm a fly, nor is it a tack on fundamentalist Christians, but rather a discussion concerning some of the so-called facts offered in some anti-Halloween publications. Another popular modern myth connects Stonehenge with Celtic culture, that thrived in Britain before the Romans came. A priestly caste among the Celts called the Druids were believed to have supervised construction of Stonehenge and other stone circles in the region. Under the supervision of Druids, the myth goes, Stonehenge was a sacred ceremonial site. The famous slaughter stone at Stonehenge, which shows traces of red, thought to be blood-related. After a rain, was believed to have been an altar where druids performed human sacrifices. It was subsequently discovered that the redness derives from iron minerals in the slaughter stone. There is no historical or archaeological evidence that the druids constructed or worshipped at Stonehenge. The idea was popularized in the 18th century by Dr. William Stukeley. He perpetuated the druid link to Stonehenge in the 1740s with his book, Stonehenge a temple restored to the British Druids. The construction of the monument is most often incorrectly credited to the Druids. But the Druids appeared several thousand years later in history. Therefore Stonehenge was definitely not built by Druids. Credit for Stonehenge to the Celts continued until the 1950s, when radiocarbon testing determined that Stonehenge dated from about 3000 BCE and that work was begun on the site even before the Celts migrated into Britain from the European continent. Subsequent studies have revealed that Stonehenge was built in waves of construction spanning several centuries. Smaller stones were brought to the site around 2600 BCE and the largest stones arrived around 2100 BCE. The last work on the site dates from around 1800 BCE. They'd walk around in the night to appease the wicked spirits. On this particular evening, they would go to people's homes, knock on their door, and demand that that night before midnight, a virgin in that family be offered as a sacrifice to Samhain. They would leave, and they'd leave a little jack-o'-lantern. Don't miss all this. A jack-o'-lantern with a ghoulish carving in the face and a little piece of maybe human fat in the bottom, a coal in the bottom of that jack-o'-lantern, lighting up the ghoulish face and telling the people, this is here as a sign that we'll be back at midnight. If you don't produce the virgin, if you don't appease us, your whole family will die. And they would go off with that little cute little jack-o'-lantern we all carve at Halloween, sitting there. When they returned at midnight, if the virgin daughter was not given for sacrifice, that her blood be spilled, a hexagram would be drawn on the door in blood. A hexagram, not a pentagram, a hexagram, which means there's a hex against the family. There's a difference. Not that it means much to us Christians who have the blood of Jesus, but for information's sake, they put a hexagram on the door in blood, and that would mean that by morning, everyone in the house would perish that they had put a hex against that family. If the treat pleased the Druids, they would leave a jack-o'-lantern with a lighted candle made of human fat to protect those inside from being killed by demons that night. The pumpkin is a New World plant that never grew in Europe until modern times, so it could not have been used to make jack-o'-lanterns by the Druids. 
human fat I'm told by a biologist would make a lousy candle fuel, even if anyone were psychotic enough to try. Apparently turnips were used to make lanterns in Ireland and Scotland, but these were not the plants that Americans know as turnips. One correspondent told me, a turnip to the Scots-Irish is not what the English would call a turnip. Rather than being white and purple skinned, it is yellow and purple, and is known to the English as a swede. They are between half a foot and a foot in diameter. These are harder to carve than pumpkins, which is probably why Irish immigrants to North America switched to using the latter, but still easier to carve than the roots the Americans and British call turnips. There is no historical references to the turnips being used as jack o' lanterns in Ireland until modern times, or of turnip lamps being used in the Paleo-Pagan Celtic territories, where the Druids once worshipped. Although popular histories of Halloween claim that the practice goes back to ancient celebrations of Samhain, in fact there is little primary documentation of masking or costuming on Halloween before the 20th century. Costuming became popular for Halloween parties in America in the early 1900s, as often for adults as for children. The first mass-produced Halloween costumes appeared in stores in the 1930s when trick or treating was becoming popular in the United States. What sets Halloween costumes apart from costumes for other celebrations or days of dressing up is that they are often traditionally designed to imitate supernatural and scary beings. Costumes are again. Traditionally those of monsters such as vampires, ghosts, skeletons, witches, and devils. There are also costumes of pop culture figures like presidents, or film, television, and cartoon characters. Over time. The costume selection extended to include popular characters from fiction, celebrities, and generic archetypes such as ninjas and princesses. <laughs>